can start recording. <laughs> okay, just double check, make sure that it is all getting recorded. Yes, it is. Very good. All right. <coughs> I couldn't get my password typed because I'm so used to my gaming keyboard. <laughs> what key is it? Huh? What kind of keys? Um, I got the, uh, I think they're the blue keys. Oh, yeah, they yeah. are. Most tactile of the keys. I can't go keys to you, probably. I've got brown. The browns are the softer, the more quiet. What's the string? I think his name is Mr. Yeah, it's the right name, it just could check the password. Which was T A dot K? T A U Y E U S. That's the right one. <coughs> okay, alright. So let's. <coughs> let me just kind of zoom in here. Alright, just in case you know you guys don't know about this feature yet, there's a upcoming events in Moodle and what it does is it will look, I think look forward, what, about two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything due within two weeks, it will pop up here. Um, so it, basically there are certain reminders for myself to take well, you know, about the 9.15, I'm not sure whether it will give me a reminder, like pop up on the screen at some, at some time, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but the basic set theory assessment, which is basically a homework assignment, is due on the 29th, which is Thursday, not today, I, I thought it was today. Um, the function homework assignment, you know, depending on um, whether I can get to the topics today, um, I will postpone the due date if I cannot get through with all of the topics today, okay? Um, so that's it. Um, are there any questions about the homework assignment, about set theory? Um, some people are turning in already. I saw a few, you know, perfect scores, you know, so some people were doing pretty good with uh, all that uh, math stuff. Any other questions? Yep. How do you know if you get a perfect score or not? Because you don't get any immediate feedback. You do not get any immediate feedback because that's the, kind of the whole point, you know, because if I give you guys, you know, Certain questions are multiple choice, if I remember correctly. So if I give you immediate feedback and it has an unlimited amount of attempts, you know, eventually people will get to the right answer. <laughs> I thought I only have one attempt, one attempt. So. Yeah, there's only one attempt. So what you need to do is to kind of really understand the material and, you know, look at the question and be, you know, if you really understand the material, you'll be confident about your answer. I'm confident, I just wonder what I got. <laughs> <laughs> I need to hard to elaborate too. Okay. It's harder to collaborate. So if you if you do that, then like you know you you don't know if you got it right or wrong. Well, you know you can ask questions in class. Uh, for instance, if you have a question about a particular concept in the in the quiz in the homework assignment, instead of asking me you know like specifically that question, you can just kind of ask a more general question like, okay, what is intersection? Okay, you know. Then I can give you a picture, a diagram, an example, and stuff like that, so that you understand the concept, and that enables you to answer the question. Yep. I've got one then. Is Go ahead. Um, what can you infer when you know the number of elements between the intersection of two sets and the union of two sets? Okay. Well, you know, I will give you a diagram. <clears throat> okay. So here are two sets, right? You know, one and two. Okay, so the union of these two, you know, these two do not intersect, right? So they do not share any elements. So the question now is, if I look at the number of elements in here, and the number of elements in here, and the number of elements in the union, how do they relate? This is one extreme case because they do not intersect, all right? The other extreme case is when the two sets are exactly the same. Then you look at the union, and you look at the intersection, and then you say, okay, what can we say about this extreme case about the intersection? What is the size or the cardinality of the intersection of these two sets? No set. Zero, right? It's an empty set. They do not intersect. They do not share any elements. But when you look at the second extreme case, they share everything. Every single element of one set is in the other set as well. So what can you say about the union, or the size, or the cardinality of the union, as well as the cardinality of the intersection? 
So you kind of think about it this way, you know, kind of think of more extreme cases. Um, you can also think about the empty set. Okay, what is the union? Um, how does intersecting with the empty set affect the number of elements in the intersection? What about the union with an empty set? Okay, so think about all of these extreme cases, and it will give you an idea of you know how the number of elements in a set um, infer something, you know, about the union or the intersection. Is that yep. kind of okay? Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay. So without telling you the exact answer, I'm just telling you how to kind of approach it, you know, how to think about it, and what extreme cases you should think about in order to answer that question. Any other questions? I think you had your hand up oh, a little actually, bit earlier. I asked the same question, but I actually had a different one. Uh, I was just wondering, is okay. there like uh, different types? Can you compare tuples and uh, sets? Like if you say like this is a tuple, or I uh, just say, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, a tuple, and then like another one's uh, maybe a uh, set of tuples. Like is there mm -hmm. like a, you know, is this like a... Yes, yep. So the question is, um, if I have a tuple, okay, let me just... Uh, and by the way, you can you can pronounce you can pronounce it as tuple or tuple. You know, it means the same thing. I looked it up. <coughs> so they are comparable uh, objects. Yes, they are comparable objects. In order for a tuple to match another tuple, they must have the same number of elements, and each element must have the same value. And that definition can be recursive. In other words, you can have a tuple where one of the elements is another tuple, and you can just reapply the same technique to the tuple inside the tuple. Is that answering your question? Yep. Go ahead. So a tuple can be an element of a set of tuples. A tuple can be an element of a set of tuples. Yes. Okay. In fact, that becomes very important when we deal with functions and also with cross um, uh, cross product of sets, the Cartesian product of sets. So I'm going to open up a mouse pad here, you know, because I'm Oh, that's not the right one. That's controlling the actual mouse. There we go, mouse pad. There we go. All right. So the question was, um, okay, is is this true? Okay, so I have a tuple, let's say one, three, okay, it's a tuple. And the most important part is to understand that when we, when we write a tuple, we do not use the curly braces, okay? We use parentheses. So this part is kind of like the syntax of you know how to represent a tuple as opposed to how to represent a set. So when we represent the one three as a tuple, the question is, if I have a statement like this in, okay, because I, I can't really type the little um, element element of you know symbol using a text editor, so I'm just going to use in as a replacement for that operator. Um, but I can still use curly braces, uh, one four. Uh, two, five, <coughs> and you know, that is my set. The answer is it is false. Okay, it is not true that one three as a tuple is inside a set that has two tuples. One element in this set is one four, and the other element is two five. Is that okay? Your questions about this part? Okay. <coughs> And the, one way to look at this is you can look at this as a as a pixel. Okay, this is the coordinate of a pixel, and you can say is that pixel one of the pic of one is that one of the pixels that has a, a color of black? Okay, and you can consider these things as pixels that has a color of black. So that's one way to look at it. Okay. Any other questions about? Yep. Go ahead. Would you like to draw a picture of the difference? Like a subset and a proper subset? A subset versus a proper subset. Okay, very good. So with a subset, okay, you know, when you have a subset, it simply means that one, they cannot have uh, different elements. That's it. Okay, the two sets, you know, cannot have, how should I put it? Okay, this would not be a subset situation. Because you know, in either way, you cannot find uh, you can find elements that is in one, but not but it's not in the other one, and it works in both in both cases. On the other hand, if you have a situation like this, you can find elements that is in the outer, the bigger set that is not in the inner set, but not the other way around. That makes this a subset of the outer set. So the question is, do we have anything 
here. If this region is empty, then it is just a subset of, not a proper subset of. Um, if this region has at least one element, then the inner set is a proper subset of the outer set because it is truly, quote unquote, smaller than the outer set. And any other questions? Yep. What happens if you use the element of operator except with two, two sets? With two different sets. Let's okay. say set B is 1 and 2, and then uh, set A is 1, 2, 3, and 4. Would B element of A be true or false? No, that would not be true because when you have two different sets, um, OK. Let me, let, me, let me put it in another, in another way. Let me just write it down on the whiteboard so this way it's recorded. Okay. Uh, can you restate your example? Okay, B is a set that contains the elements 1 and 2. 1 and 2. And then A is another set that contains 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And the question is B um, in A? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Now, B in A is really um, a statement, okay? It can be true, it can be false. So the question is, is it true or false? It is false. It is actually false. Okay? It is false because B is a set. Do, do I see any set in A? Do I see any set as an element in A? No. Well, that answers the question, right? So B in A is false in this case. If A had like a nested, sub, uh, nested set, would that be true then? Yep. That would make it true because if you modify you know, A so that it contains an element which by itself is also a set, then you know, this way B in A is true. So you can't have a set that contains sets as elements. That is, that's okay. In fact, you know, that is the one topic that we'll start today, which is the last, one of the last topics of set theory which is the concept of a power set. Is that part okay? Yep, go ahead. So you can't say that B is an element of A. I can now. You can now, but before yep. you could not. Well, before you can still say you know B is in A, it's just that that statement is false. It you, is not true. Well, you can say B is a subset of A. You can say before it is, even now it is, okay? You, now. Okay, now it's kind of like a strange situation because B is in A as an element, but you can also say that B is a subset of A because all elements of B can also be found in A. So in this case, it is both. Both statements are true. And then A minus B is not the empty set. So it would be a proper subset. It would be a proper subset, correct. So in this particular case, B in A is true. But it is also, this is also true, you know, B is a proper subset of A is also true. They're true at the same time. And that's only because 1, 2 as a, as a set is actually an element of A as well as, you know, 1 and 2 individually are also elements of A. Yep. If you remove the nested set and then uh, since it, like, B is still a subset of A, right? And yes. But you can't say that B is in A? That is correct. You cannot say that B is in A if 1, 2 is not in A. But it is in A, it is not uh, you know, only the but that set in, B. But the that in B means an element of. So, okay. So let, 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 me, let me just write this a li in a little bit more clear case. Okay, so we'll say case 1. This is case 1. So in case 1, uh, we have a B, a set B, which only has two elements, 1 and 2. We have another set, which is A, which has five elements, okay? A as a set has five elements. It has one, two, three, four as elements. It also has a fifth element being a set all by itself, and that particular set has elements one and two. And that's perfectly okay. That's not a problem. It's just like you, know, you can have containers or lists or arrays that can contain other arrays. But in the case of a set, they do not have to have the same type. So you can have individual elements. You can also have a whole set as an element at the same time. Okay. Yep. So can, just presentation wise, can you write it down 1, 2, 3, 4, B? 1, 2, 3, 4, B. Um, 
suppose you can. Yep. They, they mean the same thing, so. They, they mean the same thing. You know, B is defined to be a set of two elements, one and two. So you can substitute any time you see you know, curly brace with one, two inside, you can substitute that with B, because by definition, B is a set of one, two as elements. Okay, so this is case one. So let's take a look at case two, and you know, it will just be a comparison so that we can see both cases. And we say in case two, uh, set A is defined to be like this. Okay, this is the original question. Okay, this is the original case. So in case two, B is still defined the same way. It has two elements, one and two. But A now only has four elements. It has individual numbers as one, two, three, four as elements. B in A in this case is false because B as a set of one, two is no longer found as an element in A. So this is actually false in this case. But B is a proper subset of A. It's still true because every element that I can find in B, which is 1 and 2, can also be found in A as elements. And A minus B is not an empty set. And, <coughs> and exactly. There are elements in A that cannot be found in B. Yep. So this changes when you start doing two tuples, correct? Say again? So if you had two tuples, right? Right. Then it changes because B could be an element of A. Like say if you had one comma, like in tuples we yeah. do not use subset of or in, you know, the notations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or typically we do not because, you know, tuples are usually used in a different context where, you know, the element in or uh, mm -hmm. subset of do not apply. So if you have a, a set of two tuples, okay, and you have a set of one to of one to double, uh -huh. then you could say that the elements in one could be a subset of another. That is correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, in fact, we will see that today when we deal with functions. Yep. Any other questions about your know, case one and case two? That's actually a pretty good question. I should make note and make it a question in the test. Which question was the question? <laughs> this one. You know, the first one, you know, case one is actually a pretty good question. Putting a set inside another set and see if it is called an element of that set. And also at the same time a subset of it. Because in that in this specific case, in case one, B is both. Okay, it is both an element and also a subset. What can you say about this? Hmm? What can you say about these two sets? Well they're not empty. <laughs> Are there any other questions about you know set theory? Go ahead. Can you explain why B is proper subset on A in case two? In case two? It is true in the diagram. Okay, so okay, what we want to do is to find out, okay, how do we define you know what is a subset, right? <clears throat> a subset is there are, there are different ways to you know, define what a subset is. Um, you can define a subset like you know B is a proper okay, let me just look up the notes. Okay, so this way we can find out you know where to find that information. So it's over here and we scroll down to subtraction. Okay. So first of all we want to understand what is set subtraction. Okay. So in this case if D is defined to be a set that is the difference between X and Y, okay, so X minus Y, um, then D would have elements that we can find in X but not in one. Okay, so by definition, this is how the difference is defined. Because when you look at the actual definition, this is basically saying for every element x in D, they have to meet this requirement. The requirement is, first of all, that element has to be in x. But also at the same time, that element cannot be in y. Okay, so that's how we define you know, difference. And then you, if you scroll down a little bit, you will find you know, a discussion of a subset of. Okay? So in this case, if B is a subset of A, then the B minus A has to be an empty set. So there cannot be any element that is in B but not in A. Is that, is that okay? All right. So later on, you know, it also defines what a subset is or a proper subset is. 
So, yep, go ahead. Could you show case two as a Venn diagram? Case two as a Venn diagram. Yes, I can. Um, let me finish this and then I'll go back to talk about it. Okay. So in here we have the concept of a proper subset. So if B, if and only if B is a subset of A, then B minus A is a is an empty set because a proper subset is a special case of a subset, of a normal subset. So the first requirement is still here because you, you still have to have a, a usual subset first. But then additional requirement is A minus B cannot be empty. There has to be at least one element that is in A, that, which is the superset, that is not found in the subset B. So that's how a proper subset is defined. Is you know, One set has to be at least one element, quote unquote, bigger compared to the other set. Now, when when I say you know one element bigger, you remember how I used quotes because there are many many sets that have an infinite number of elements. So when you have an infinite number of elements, how can you say one is bigger than the other one? Because infinite cannot be bigger than infinite. So the only thing you can say is there are elements in one that cannot be found in the other one, and they can both be infinitely big. But you can still say that one has elements that cannot be found in the other one. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you can find examples like that. Uh, if you consider all the fractions as opposed to all the integers, a set of all fractions is a superset of a proper superset of the set of all integers. Because certain values can only be represented as a fraction, but not as an integer. So even though both sets are infinitely big, one is still, you know, considered the superset of the other. Is that okay? That's all right. All right. So getting back to the diagram thing, right? Okay. You want case two? Well, I can show you both case one and case two. Okay, as Venn diagrams. <coughs> and obviously, this part won't be recorded unless somebody takes a picture and send it to me. Actually, I have to learn how to use a uh, Elmo because uh, this is. This is what it's for, but I have not found you know how found out how to use it yet. So I have to uh, you know kind of fiddle with it and find out you know how to get it to work with Linux first. Two cam. Hmm. Two cam. Say again. Two cam work. It couldn't find it. It did not register as a uh, as a video device that li video for Linux device. Um. Okay. So getting back to case one. So let's deal with case one first. This is what case one looks like. So in case one, A is clearly uh, the superset. Actually, that is the case in both cases. And B is the smaller set. And we want to use A. Okay, this is A, and this is B. We know what B has, right? B only has two elements, which is one and two. And I'll just use a bubble to indicate this is actually individual items, okay, maybe squares. Because bubbles you know, seems to suggest it's a set. So I'll use a square to indicate these are individual elements. And in case one, we also have one, two in A. But I don't have to redraw one and two because A includes B. Okay. Uh, but then it has the other elements, which is a three, a four, and also another set that has the elements of one and two. So that means it has a set of elements one, two, being grouped as a set. And that becomes its own element, and it is not considered a subset anymore. Is that OK? Now, we can also make a case three, you know, as if things are not sufficiently confusing. Yep. So in that particular case, B is a subset, a proper subset of A. Okay. Yep. And the set inside of A is a proper subset of A. Say again. B is a proper subset of A. Yes. The set inside of A is also a proper subset of A. Because it yes. contains, yeah, contains yep. one and two. Yep. Yep. Okay, so let's let's make a case three which is even more confusing. I think that one's really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but this is important because yeah. this is how we can, you know, understand or, or at least tell whether, whether we have a proper understanding of this material. Okay, let's get rid of one and two here. Okay, so in case three, B is still the same. It has elements one and two. 
But this time, set A, which used to be the superset, only has three elements. One element is three, one element is four, and then the third element, as an entire element, is a set of one and two, okay? So in this case, B is in A is actually true, because one, two, as a set, is found as an element in A. Is that okay? So that makes B an element of A. That's good, that's not a problem. On the other hand, B is not a subset, proper or not, it is not a subset of A. Okay, well, okay, I have to be consistent. B is a subset of A is false, okay? And the reason why this is the case is, um, find me an element in B that is also found in A. Okay, let's take a look at the first one, okay? Let's look at the element one. Is one found in A as an individual element? Nope. What about two? Nope. <coughs> so that means A and B do not even have any intersection. Yep. So the only way to make the second part true is to make B a nested set. So it had to be a set of the element one, two, of the set one, two. Correct. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? No. <laughs> you can consider, you know, a struct in a struct, that kind of uh, scenario. Yep. In this case, well, basically, in this case, in order for B to be a subset of A, the individual elements in B have to appear in A. Each individual element of B has to be a individual element of A. Right. That will make B a subset of A. But, but B is an element of A because A contains a, a set that is one. That has two. the same elements as B. Right. And the only way to make it a subset is to make it a, be a nested set. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So it will be a uh, subset. A tuple can be an element okay. of a set. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. An element of a set, and we, have, uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit when we talked about Cartesian product. So when you have a Cartesian product, then you pick one element from one set, you pick an element from the other set, and you combine those two into a two-tuple in this case. And then the two-tuple is considered you know, one thing. Okay. Yeah. So um, getting back to uh, a Cartesian product. Okay. Do we have any questions that I can answer? Did you uh, ever draw case two? Oh, case two? OK, yeah. sure, we can draw case two. So. Unfortunately, I cannot copy and paste, you know, which I can do it on the whiteboard, <laughs> because they are really similar. So in case two, we have you know, individual element one, individual element two, and then we have individual element three, individual element four, and that's it. That's the whole picture. But B is in A. Huh? <laughs> but we don't say that B is in A. We say that B is a subset of A, or A contains B. You know, but in you know, the word in in set theory has a very specific meaning. It means it's an element of. Gotcha. It mm -hmm. means that the set has to be part of it, not the individual elements themselves. Correct. You know, whether we are talking about individual elements or not, you know, that becomes important. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Get out of the camera view. All right. So let's talk about the uh, Cartesian product because that's what we talked about last time. The Cartesian product is a concept of cross product. So you can have you know um, a set of you know A B C. I don't really you know just an example, right? One and two. So the Cartesian product of these two is basically a set of tuples where all combinations from the first one and the second one are considered. Because the first set has three elements, and the second set has two elements, so when you look at the Cartesian product, it would have six, three times two, which is six individual elements. Each element of the Cartesian product would pick the first item from the first set, and the second item from the second set. So in this case, you will end up with six elements, and the six elements will be A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, 
C1, C2, and that's the Cartesian product of these two individual sets. Would a Cartesian product of uh, tuples result in a tuple with tuples in it? Would the Cartesian, Cartesian product of a tuple of with a tuple? tuple? But we don't define Cartesian product to a tuple. We define Cartesian product on sets. Well, I mean, I mean a, a set of tuples. Okay. I have two, well, two sets Absolutely. of tuples. Absolutely, you can do it. You, in other words, this is how you can um, create you know, uh, a tuple that can contain a tuple. Okay. So, but we do not dissolve the boundary of tuples. Okay. okay. So, okay. Let, let's let's make let, make an example out of this one. Okay. Tuple of tuples. So we'll go ahead and take this one, and I'll make it a somewhat you know trivial case. So we'll multiply this or use a Cartesian product with. Um, and by the way, you can have you know the same values too. Okay. It doesn't really you know. So in this case, if I cross product with just one as a second set, the end result is going to be only six elements. But the first element is going to have, the, the first element is technically a two tuple. But the first thing of this two tuple is a tuple itself. So it's a two tuple, two tuple. <laughs> is that OK? That does work. OK. And the same thing applies to all of the other ones. <coughs> so the second one is a tuple of two, except the first part of the tuple is a tuple. This makes me think of three-dimensional coordinates. It is. This is how you can make it a multi-dimensional quote-unquote you know, construct. So I'm going to, I just want to make this complete you know, so that people don't accidentally think that it is not. This is how to draw pixels using the graphics. Yep. So is that answering your question? In other words, tuples can nest. Sets can nest as well. Any other questions? Yep. Does the order of the um, set you get after is part of the Is it always going to be that order? Ordering within a set is insignificant. It is not important. So that means, you know, when I look at, I only wrote it this way because, you know, I systematically generate the uh, the tuples, but. You know, you can easily rewrite it any way you want. Just you know, copy and paste it. You know, cut and paste. You know, that would be considered exactly the same cross product, because within a set, you know, using curly braces, individual items within a set enclosed by curly braces, the ordering is not significant. When you're using parentheses, on the other hand, the ordering is important, and you can have duplicate values within items surrounded by. All right. Any other questions? I like these questions. Yep. Uh, can we cross a set with an empty set? Can we cross a set with an empty set? Of course you can. And then what do you get? Set. You get an empty set. <laughs> so anything, uh, the Cartesian product of anything with an empty set is an empty set. Because by definition, each element of the Cartesian product has to pick one thing from the first set and pick something from the second set. If the second set is empty, then there's no way you can make anything in the result. Any other questions? Yep. So this can get further complicated by having two sets of two tuples, like large amounts. And then just yeah, but the concept is still the same. You're just picking one. And pick, you, it, it's, it's basically saying for each element of the first set, you <coughs> pick any element from the second set and make the, turn that into a two tuple in the product. Yep. So basically, each two tuple would appear as one item of, the, of in another two tuple. In the two tuple of the result. So it'd be a two tuple of a two tuple. That is correct. Okay. All right. Any other questions? No other questions? All right. So if there are no questions about this, we'll go ahead and talk about um, two more topics in um, set theory. <clears throat> the first one is uh, power set. This is one thing that we did not talk about. Now, power set is kind of interesting. So the power set of a set is a set of all subsets 
of set S in this case. Okay. It's a set of all possible subsets, proper or not. Okay. So let's take a look at this particular example. So we're still using the example of cars that I like. Okay. It has three elements. It has Miata, MR2, and Civic. Okay. We, we have used this example <coughs> in the previous class. The power set of T in this case would be a set of an empty set as an element, a set with Miata all by itself as an element, a set with MR2 all by itself as an element, a set with Civic all by itself as an element, a set with Miata and MR2 as elements, a set with Miata and Civic as, an el as elements, a set with MR2 and Civic as, an, as elements, and a set with all three cars as elements. So the power set of something is by itself a set of all possible subsets. It, it makes sense, but why is an empty set a subset of just the empty set? Because an empty set, set is a subset of everything, About. including itself. It is not a proper subset of itself, but it is a subset of itself. Because it still meets the requirement of everything in an empty set is found in an empty set, which is nothing. But it's not an element yet, but it's just the definition. Right. Yeah. But it still meets that definition. Yep. So is the empty set a proper subset of a set with items or with elements? Say that again? Is the empty set a proper subset of all other sets though? An empty set is a proper subset of all sets except for empty set. Because you know, if a set has at least one element, then it becomes a proper superset of, a, of an empty set. All right. So are there any questions about this? Now, we have seen something like this before. Believe it or not, the concept of a power set is something that is not really old. Okay? We have seen it. Let's think about integers, okay? I'm hoping by this time, you know, by the time we get to CISB 440, most people know that integers are represented as binary numbers inside a computer. Is that okay? Okay, so I'm hoping that is not foreign anymore. So let's talk about just four bits, okay? We're talking about four bit representation of integers. Okay, what is the big deal? We have four individual bits, okay? This is called bit zero, bit one, bit two, bit three. Now, the presence of a one of a particular bit, you can call that a presence, okay, in, okay? So when you look at a set of all the bit positions, which is zero, one, two, three, well, this is a boring set of, you know, zero, one, and two, and three, which are the bit positions of the four bit number. There's no big deal about this, right? How many numbers, how many values can I represent using only four bits? Two to the, n two. Two to the power of four. Four, four, right? So we have what? We have zero, 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 where none of the bits is a one. We have zero, 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 one, where bit zero is a one. We have zero, zero, one, zero, where bit one is a one, but all other bits are zeros, right? So when you look at, let's call this, you know, S here, so when you look at the power set of S, what do you get? Oh, we know what we, we kind of know what it is. It starts with an empty set when none of the bits mm -hmm. is a one. Zero, one two. We have zero, which is which means bit zero is a one, bit one is a one, and so on. And then we move on to sets with two elements. So we have zero one, which means this is one one as a binary number, and we have. 101 as a binary number, and so on. And then we have three items, right? So, so we have 111 as a set, and so on. So when you look at the power set of this particular set, it can be interpreted as integers, possible integer values of a four bit number. So we have seen something like this already because a power set is really just saying, okay, I, I want to evaluate, I want to have a list for a set of all possible subsets where, you know, each thing inside this original set can be absent or present. Is that part okay? 
Yes. Okay. All right. Great. So power set has kind of limited application, you know, so we are not going to spend too much time to talk about it except, you know, for, you know, what it is. But I did write one additional slide which help hopefully, you know, relates to uh, set and programming because, you know, a lot of times people taking this class would think, oh, this is all math, you know, I don't really need to know it, I just need this class to get my degree, okay? But you know, on the other hand, we actually do use, you know, the concept of a set in many different types of actual programming. This is probably foreign to most of you, okay? You know, most people do not use the select call in C. This is not even C++, this is really low level, okay? Most of the time, the select call translates directly to a system service. For those of you who took uh, assembly language programming, you probably remember software interrupt, you know, 0x80, okay? Select is one of those you know, services. You can tell the operating system and say, I want to block, okay? If nothing happens to any one of these file descriptors, FDs, um, I want to block and just give all the processing resources to somebody else. But as soon as one of the file descriptors has any activity, like something for me to read, or there's room for me to write to, wake me up so I can do something about it. Okay? So if you read the text here, you know, it basically talks about, you know, in general, what is a select call. So, okay, so right here. Uh, some programs require a single thread to handle the reading or writing of multiple files. So when you have a program that has a nature like that, like one single thread you know, has the responsibility to read and write multiple files, then you have a problem. Because if you try to read from a file and there's nothing to read from at a time, then your whole thread is kind of blocked and basically stop and go like, okay, I'm gonna wait here until there's something to read here. But meanwhile, maybe when you need to write to a file, you know, that file has capacity for you to write to. And most of the time when we talk about reading and writing, you know, files in this case, it's not translating to a file in a file system. Most of the time it is translating to a communication channel as in a socket in networking, okay? Then it makes sense, right? Because, you know, if you are a web server, okay, sometimes, you know, certain clients will work very slowly because of the connection. And other clients will work faster. So, you know, you don't want to wait because somebody is really slow and it just stalls everybody else. So the select call allows you to tell the operating system and say, hey, operating system, I want you to monitor these files or these sockets. If there's anything I can do about any one of these files, wake me up so I can do something about it. So the way you do it is you give the operating system a set of file descriptors. And a <laughs> file descriptor is just an image, okay? <clears throat> and you give the operating system a set of these integers and just say that, okay, these are the things that I, I want you to monitor. If anything can be done, wake me up. So the operating system will wake you up, the thread, if there's something you can do. But when, once you wake up, how do you know which file descriptor has something to do? Like, okay, there's some content to read from, there's room to write to, and so on and so forth. You have to examine the set, right? and see whether a particular element, a particular integer, is in it or not. So that's one application of set in actual practical system programming. And this is actually low level programming too, this is not high level at all. Um, for those of you who took C++ or object oriented programming, CISP 400, did they talk about the template class called set? No. They did? No? Kind of? That's like they went over the template. Okay, but did they talk about the set template class? No. No. Okay. Well, it does exist. Okay. So there is a call, there's a concept called a set template class, and it's really primitive. It doesn't give you intersection, element of, and stuff like that. Um, it just gives you the ability to traverse through a set. So it gives you an iterator, and with an iterator, you can plus plus, you know, increment, and you know, you can detect whether you're at the end or not. That's the only thing it supports, is you know, basically um, the, the, the ability to go through a set, element by element. On how many people write uh, programs also in one of these uh, scripting languages? Perl, Python, PHP, and so on? 
most of these, all of these three languages support the concept of not exactly a set, but as, uh, a hash or an uh, associative you know, list. And they give you a construct as a language. Like in Perl, it has a construct called for each. Okay? And that allows you to go through each and every element of a list. Not a set, just a list. But it is still a very similar concept. So these are the actual application of concepts of sets when we deal with programming. Now, I'm not including it here, but SQL also has its own um, relationship with you know, sets, especially when you deal with a field or a particular column that is considered a primary key. How many people know, know what is a primary key in a database? Okay, so what is the property of a primary key? Uh, it has to be unique. Now, how, is that, how does that have anything to do with a set? Elements in a set? They cannot be duplicates. In other words, they have to be unique. So, so once again, we're dealing with you know, similar concepts. Now, in the database, obviously, everything is sorted. Okay? They're indexed, whereas in the set, they're not. Um, but otherwise, you, know, you will still be able to reapply some of the concepts. <coughs> um, you can do a cross product in most database uh, SQL languages. And what it does is to do exactly what we talked about earlier. Okay, it will take a particular field of one table and have a cross product with a field of potentially another table. And now you have all possible combinations of values of this field and the value of the other field. Which is very time consuming because if each table has one million items, then you're looking at one million squared many items in a cross product. So that's why when you, when you do a cross product in SQL, you better think about, do I really need to do that? So that's it. You know, that's basically the last slide of um, set theory. And we are now ready to move on to the next section, unless you guys have any questions about set theories. Any questions? Yep. Can I talk about that whole principle? Say again? Oh, the pigeonhole principle. Thank you. I forgot about that one. And cardinality. And well, cardinality. We kind of talked about it, you know, last. Oh yeah, you just yeah. Go like. Oh, we got two minutes. We can talk about just the number of items inside. Yep, the number of items, the number of elements inside a set. Okay, so we'll talk about the pigeonhole principle, which actually is not, you know, a set theory idea concept, but they lump it into here, so I have to teach it this way. Well, that's a pigeon. I mean, I, you know, since we talk about pigeonhole, if you have kids, you probably know this particular pigeon. They have a whole series of books like, you know, don't let the pigeon drive the bus, uh, don't let the pigeon go to bed late, or something like that. It's fun. Okay. Okay. The pigeonhole principle is not exactly a part of set theory, so make sure that you understand that part. What it really says is something that seems to be common sense to all of us. If there are n items to put into m non-intersecting sets, okay, because I want to kind of relate it to set theory, um, and there are n is greater than m, okay, and all these sets do not intersect, then we can find at least one set a of k subscript k that has more than one element. That's basically the pigeonhole principle. In other words, if you have um, m nests for pigeons, and you have n pigeons, if n is greater than m, then at least one pigeon nest will have two pigeons. Right? Unless I want to eat it, then it will be in the pot. <laughs> but that's it. That's, that's pigeonhole, uh, that's pigeonhole, that's pigeons, pigeonhole principle. But it's really useful. It has a lot of applications. For instance, um, you can use it to prove you know, certain things. Like if I only have you know, one type of socks in my drawer, okay, so the question is how many socks do I need to take out from the drawer to make one pair? This principle is proved by like, proof of contradiction, right? It can be proven by contradiction, yep. And I, have, I think I have the proof here. 
Okay, so right here. So the, the proof of the Prigino principle is down here. It's down in the left. Yeah, well, the, the starting part is here. Now, since we have not officially introduced <coughs> proof by contradiction, which is a particular proof technique, we'll deal with it you know, quite a bit later. Um, I'm going to use an informal proof, you know, just so that you guys are exposed to the concept of proof by contradiction. So the way you do proof by contradiction is to say, well, let's say the pigeonhole principle is not true. Let's, let's, let's say it's baloney, okay, it's not true. If the principle, if the pigeonhole principle is not true, that means I can find at least one counterexample to prove it wrong. Is that working with you guys? Okay. Okay. So we'll find at least one case where the premise is met. In other words, we have n pigeons, we have n pigeonholes, and n is greater than m. But with this particular counterexample, for whatever reason, each pigeonhole only has up to one pigeon. So we have more pigeons than, than, than are, there are nests. But magically, um, each nest only has up to one pigeon. Okay? Because you have to find a case like that to prove me wrong. Okay? And the assumption is I was wrong. Okay? The pigeonhole principle is actually incorrect. So the consequence of this is, the first one is, by definition, if you add up the cardinality of all the you know, pigeon nests, it must add up to n, right? By definition, because all the pigeons are in the nest. So that has to add up to n. So OK, that's fine. But on the other hand, we also know that uh, bar a1 bar, the cardinality of each set, is at the most one. Because that's the only time pigeon, the, pigeon, the pigeonhole principle is wrong. OK, wait, hold on a second here. So we only have m of these things, and the cardinality of each one is at the most one. So when you add up the cardinality of all of these sets, we should only add up to at the most m. And m is given to be less than n. That doesn't, that doesn't sound right to me. Because by one definition, it has to equal to n, because all the pigeons should be in the nest. But on the other hand, it is also less than n. Something cannot be less than n and be equal to n at the same time. That is a contradiction. So when the assumption of the pigeonhole principle not being true leads to a contradiction, that means the pigeonhole principle has to be true. So that's the nature of proof by contradiction, is whatever you want to prove, you say, OK, let's see what happens when it is not true. Okay? And based on the assumption of what you prove, what you're trying to prove is not true, and it leads to a contradiction, that is proof by itself that whatever you were trying to prove in the first place is actually true. So we'll talk about this, this particular proof technique a little bit more later on. It is a very powerful proof technique. Okay, it is much more powerful than proving in a positive way of just you know deducing things. Yep. So, will your notes up there say that? Because um, you said m is equal to n, but it's saying up there that m or n is less than. N. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so we are given that n is greater than m, but right? that's part of the premise. The inferred conclusion is that n is less than m. The inferred conclusion is n is less than m. Shouldn't that be equal to m? Yeah, it should be e less than or equal to, because each right. nest can have up to one pigeon. But n can be greater than m and also less than or equal to. Yeah, so it be, this one should be less than or equal to. But it still does not uh, negate this. If this has to be false all the time. Right. So that's pigeonhole principle. It's not really a part of set theory, but they lump it into the set theory uh, part of the curriculum. All right, finally, we can move on to functions. Now, functions is actually quite useful. It is a very useful tool that we can use later on to prove theorems of other things. So you know, that's why it is also considered a tool. <clears throat> We're supposed to spend four hours on functions, and you know this, this, that's what the four is, is four hours of lecture time. So 
So we'll start with the introduction to functions. So a function in this context, in the context of this class, is not exactly a function in C or C++ programming. In other words, we are not talking about a subroutine that can potentially return a value. We are talking about more like a function in mathematics. Okay. So a function can be seen as a way to define or find out, you know, figure out an output from the input. You give a function the input, it will map the input to the output. The input is considered a set called the domain. In other words, this confines what you can give to a function as an argument. Okay? The domain is basically limiting, oh, you know, the input to this function can only be an element of this particular set. Is that okay? It's a restriction okay, to a function. And by the same token, the output would also be confined to a set that we call the codomain. So you have a domain that will specify what the input can, how you can choose an input from, and then we have a codomain which you know, basically you know, confines you know, what the output of the function can be. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of co uh, domain and codomain? Codomain is also called a range okay, in other type of you know, math textbooks, but I like to use the word codomain because it is you know, the opposite or the the opposite of a, of a domain. So given any element of the domain of a function, there's a corresponding element in the codomain. Now this is a very strong statement because what it is saying is if you pick any element from the domain, I can feed it to the function and it will always have something to map to from the codomain. Okay. It's a pretty strong statement because it is saying that for every element in the domain, there's something they will map to in the codomain. So in this case, I can define a really stupid function, f. And this is the, the entire definition of function f. f of 2 is 25, f of 5 is 67, and f of 1 is 102. Don't ask me why, there's no particular reason, okay? but that's how this particular function is defined. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. It's an absolutely stupid, useless function, but it is a function. So now the question is, how do we write it? Okay. How, do, how does this relate to domain, codomain, and all of those other concepts? So one way to write function f is to say that it is a map from 1 to 5 as our domain to 25, 67, 102 as our codomain. And this is why in this class, I only use a double, uh, double bar arrow to mean implication, because this uses up a single bar arrow for mapping. Are we still doing okay so far with just the notation? F maps 1, 2, 5 from the domain to the codomain of 25, 67, and 102. Is that okay? All right. And the other way to write this, if you're reading some other math textbooks and whatnot, this is the other way to represent exactly the same thing. You're basically just writing the domain on the, uh, the left-hand side of an arrow, and then you're writing the codomain on the right-hand side of the arrow, So, and then you put f on top of the arrow. It means exactly the same thing. It means that f is a function that maps 1 to 5 as a domain into 125, 67, 102 as a codomain. Same thing, just different notation. I personally like the first notation, so you will only find me using this notation in this class. All right. So to express how an element in the domain corresponds to an element in the codomain, we will utilize the notion of a two-tuple. And this is why we talked about tuples earlier. Okay? So in this case, function f can be defined like exactly that. In other words, I look at each possible element in the domain. And in the tuple, I say, what does it map to? 1 maps to 102. 2 maps to 25. And 5 maps to 67. So I make three two tuples out of that. 
and turn it into a set. That is function f. Okay, so function f is nothing more than a set of two tuples. Each tuple has the first element corresponding to an element in the domain, and the second element of the tuple corresponds to what the element of the domain maps to in the code domain. I'm just spelling it out. Are there any questions about the definition of that stupid useless function f, but in a really kind of different way? Okay, because now we are starting we are starting to use the concept of set theory and also took tuples to you know talk about to look at functions in that particular way. So in this context, then I guess the order well, are you considering those sets above the two sets that are for the like the input and the output? Those are sets too. So the ordering is not but when you say that one maps to 25 and you change the order of the set to order, then it doesn't It doesn't matter. Um, let, let me just highlight the portion and then you know, talk about it. This is a set because it is enclosed by curly braces. So the ordering within this list has absolutely nothing to do with the ordering of the code domain. I can mix this up any way I want to. I can mix up the other set any way I want to. And it will still mean exactly the same thing. Because in this notation, all it is doing is to tell you what is the domain and what is the code domain. But it does not indicate how it, how it maps. Okay? To understand how they map, you need uh, the tuples. You need the two tuple to indicate exactly how they map. So that means you know, this only tells you what the domain is, what the code domain is, but it doesn't tell you how we map from the domain to the code domain. In this case, it does enumerate all possible mapping from the code from the domain to the code domain. So now within this set here, each tuple, you can exchange the order of the tuples, but not within the tuples. Because you know, when you look at this whole thing as a set, each out, the, out, the, the arrangement of the elements is not important. But within each element, because it's a tuple, ordering is important. And you can also see how we also make use of the concept of a subset or proper subset in this case. So this set here is a proper subset of the Cartesian product of 1, 2, 5 as one set and 25, 67, 102 as the other set. Because the Cartesian product here has nine elements, but my function only has what? Three elements. So that's why you know, we kind of know for sure this is a proper subset of the others. Are we still doing OK so far with concepts of a function? Right? So in general, if you have x as a domain and y as a codomain, then f as a function seen as a set of tuples is also going to be a subset of x Cartesian product y. There's, there's only one exception to this rule. Okay, I should have written uh, subset of instead of proper subset of. The only case where this is not true is when one, when one of these sets has only one element. Then it becomes just a subset. It can be a subset not a proper subset. Okay, is that sinking in or not? Let's, let's, let's take a look at a picture. Okay. <coughs> well, not exactly a picture, but it's, it's, a, it's a solid example here. <coughs> so let's define the domain to be, I don't know, one, two, three, okay? And we'll define the codomain as just one element. Okay. Now the rule is in order for function f to be a function, it has to map everything from the domain to something in the codomain. Okay. So in this case, what is the only way to define this function? Oops. Well, we pick the first element of the domain. Let's pick one. What can it map to? Do we have a choice? No. no. 
The second element? The third element? There we go. So in this case, um, f is actually exactly the same thing as the Cartesian product of x and y. So it's not a proper subset anymore. But this is the only exception to that rule of a function has to be a proper subset of the Cartesian product of the domain and the codomain. So in general, it is a subdom it's a proper subset, but in very extreme cases like this one, it is only a subset because it is the same thing. Yep. So a function always has to have a mapping? A function is a mapping. Okay. Yep. It, it is a mapping, but the rule is you cannot leave any element in the domain unmapped. So everything in the domain has to be mapped. Yep. So is this the definition of a one-to-one -one version function versus just a general function? Not quite. Because Well, if you're using two sets, so each set has to have unique items. This so is a surjective function, but it's not an injective function. We'll, we'll talk about those terms next. Yeah. Are there any questions about this particular example? And let me just make it even more clear. This set, function f, is actually exactly the same thing as the Cartesian product of the domain and the codomain. So it's not a proper subset of it. Okay, any questions? Questions? What's the okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, what's the Cartesian product of a empty set and uh, a set of, like, say, one, two? The Cartesian product of an empty set and anything is an empty set. Because the Cartesian product has to pick one item from each set. Now, if you have an empty set, there's nothing to pick from, right? So you cannot generate any element in the Cartesian product. All right. So let's see. Yeah, we are moving on to first order logic. So we have to talk a little bit about. Oh, somebody just sent me a message. I hope it's not from this class because I'm ignoring it right now. <coughs> sure, it's not your role. Huh? Sure, it's not your role reminder. Oh, that should have happened a long time ago. Uh, but thanks for the reminder. <laughs> you're better than a computer. Huh. You're better than my phone, which I have to turn off, unfortunately. You didn't do it last class at all, right? You didn't no, I did not do it last time. So I'm going to cross out uh, the day that I did not do it. I'll do it. Okay. So all present on that day. OK. So remember to sign the, uh, put your name next to the uh, sign in sheet, the row sheet. OK, so this is a good time to talk about you know, first order logic. Now, first order logic sounds really kind of obscure, you know, because oh, what is first order? What is second order then? If there's a first order, there has to be a second order. And there is a second order, which we don't really use in this class. So first order logic is also known as predicate logic. Um, and predicate logic deals with one thing that we usually don't have to deal with. It's the notion of everyone versus someone, OK? So when you think about how we use everyone or everybody, everything in English, as opposed to someone or something in English, that's pretty much you know, what predicate calculus is trying to capture, okay? is to say, okay, do we have at least one thing that will do this, or do we have everything that will do this? Okay? We're trying to qualify um, you know, the one, do we have at least one thing, or do we have everything that meet a certain requirement. So in first order logic, we use this kind of inverted A symbol to mean everyone. Or if you prefer, it is also called for all. Okay? So inverted A is for all. And then the inverted E, inverted in a different way, is there exist. Or it means someone, somebody. There exists someone that can blah, 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 blah. Hmm? It's not epsilon. Epsilon it's is the other way. The other way. Yeah. yeah, this is this is a horizontal mirror of E, but the A is a vertical mirror of A. Or actually, you can look at both as a 180 degree rotation of the original one. So that's a 
Well, for those of you who take PCAM or physical chemistry, you will know all these you know, point group things here. Like therefore. Hmm? Like therefore. Therefore. Yeah. Three dots, therefore. Okay. So the term predicate refers to some kind of evaluation that has a Boolean result. It can be an expression or it can be any arbitrary way to uh, true false from a tuple of elements from sets. So in this case, I'm just using this as a predicate x mod y equals to 0. We know what my mod is, right? It's the remainder of a division. So x mod y equals to 0 is a predicate because it can be true, it can be false. Okay? It's just a Boolean expression. Um, and depending on which x and which y you pick, it can be true or false. Okay. So now we move on and kind of talk about, OK, that said, we can now redefine <coughs> the qualifications of a function with a domain of x and a codomain of y. Now, first of all, this still has to be true. You know, I should have used the, the uh, just a subset of because you know it have sometimes it can just be a subset, it's not a proper subset of. But you know, pretend it as a bar under the subset of you know, simple proper subset of. This has to be true. Okay, you know the a function is um, a subset of the Cartesian product of a domain and a codomain. So that part is not impacted by the availability of for all and there exist. Now let's take a look at the second statement, which is kind of cryptic. Okay, so let's take a look at this one here. Okay, what is it saying? What the heck is that saying? Okay. Okay, let's take a look. It says for all x, okay? Now when we say for all x, we are not even qualifying whether x is an element of x, uppercase x, cap, uh, cap x or not. We just say considering all things, okay? For all things, okay? Okay, now what can we say about that thing? Well, the predicate is whatever is next to the for all symbol. So this part becomes the predicate, okay? It's a kind of long predicate here. So we want to say, okay, what exactly is this saying? We have a disjunction here, and we have a negation here. So the first part is basically saying, if x is not an element of uppercase x, which is our domain, ah, this whole thing is by default true. Which essentially is saying, if x is not an element of the domain, we don't care. That's all it's saying. Is that okay? Because if x is something that is not an element of our domain, that is true. The negation of x is an element of the domain is true, which makes the entire statement true. So that is basically saying, eh, that's true anyway. In other words, we only consider the right-hand side of the disjunction when x is actually an element of x. Because if x is actually an, an element of, do, of the domain, then this expression is false. Then the only chance to make the expression true is this has to be true. In other words, we focus on this part, the right-hand side of the disjunction, only when x is actually an element of the domain. Okay. If x is an element of the domain, what this is saying is go ahead and find a set that consists of elements of tuples. Okay? And we are only interested in <coughs> elements x, y, that is an element of f, which is the function itself, right? At this time, x is already fixed. We know what x is. x is not, uh, x is an element of x by the time we evaluate this part. Knowing x is a particular element of the domain, what we are basically now saying is uh, find a subset of f where we only have elements of uh, that has x as the first component of the tuple. Okay. And that set, okay, let me just highlight the set that we are talking about here. This set must have exactly one element. It cannot have zero element. It cannot have more than one element. It has to have exactly one element. Okay. Sorry? X, Y can only happen once inside the function. That for that particular X and that particular Y. Right. For each, it, it, in, in literal English, it means for each element in the domain, 
it must map to one and only one element in the code domain. That's basically what it's saying. So if and only if. Sorry? If and only if. If and only if. If and only if x is an element of the domain, it can map to one and only one element in the code domain. Yep. Okay, that's, that's what it's saying. OK, let's take a look at some examples, OK, so that we can see whether something is a function or not. OK? So let's take a look at um, function here. This function is supposed to map from this set AB to um, this set here uh, CD. Right? So now we have stated the intended domain, which is AB as a set, and the intended codomain, which is CD as a set. So now let me go ahead and define the actual mapping. And you can tell me whether f is a function or not. So I will say, you know, f, OK, let me see. I'll, I'll, I'll use this notation. I'll use the set notation just to be consistent. So ac is an element of the function. And we'll make bc also an element of the function. And that's it. That's, that's my definition of this function. Is f an actual function? Does it meet the requirement that we were just talking about earlier? Yes. For each element in the domain, does it map to one and only one element in the codomain? The answer is yes. It does meet that requirement. Nothing says that they cannot map to the same element in the codomain, and nothing says that all elements in the codomain must be mapped. Right? So we have met the requirement. Let's take a look at the second case. Um, so I will say here um, f is a function. Okay. So let's take a look at a second case where we have ac and ad. Oops. I have to use the other parentheses. Just hold on a second. Let me fix it first. Is f a function in this case? No. Can I claim that for each element in the domain, it maps to one and only one element in the codomain? No. No, because in this case, element C, of element, sorry, element B of the domain is not mapped at all. So that means you know, in this particular definition, f is not a function. OK, fine. f is not a function because element B is not mapped. Element B is in the domain, by the way. OK, let's take a look at another example. What about this one? A, C, and B, D. Is that a, prop is that a function? Yes. No. Why not? Because C is not in the domain of that. It's in the range of that, isn't it? C is in the range. But the requirement of a function is everything in the domain mm -hmm. has to be mapped. So it's we a have function. A in the domain, we have B in the domain, and they're both mapped by this function to something in the code domain. Okay. So it is a function. Okay, in this case it is a function. So F okay. is a function. And let's take a look at one more example here, A C and A D. Oh, we just got that, right? Uh, let's see. AC. Try A and B. Oh, okay, got it. There we go. Okay, that's it. Is that a function? Yes. Okay, wait, wait, hold on, hold on a second here. Okay, so let's let's think about why this is or why this is not a function. Okay. Now there are two things to being a function. First, everything in do in the domain has to map has to be mapped to something in the codomain. But that's not exactly what I said. What I said was everything in the dom every element in the domain has to map to one and only one thing in the whole domain. So in this particular proposed function, A is mapped to two elements 
in the codomain. Which makes it not a function. And that makes it not a function. Yep. So technically, wouldn't your second function, uh, function equals AC and AD, also not be a function because yes. A is being mapped to yep. things? Mm -hmm. Yep. The same rationale also applies to that one. So to, to make this really clear, I'll just get rid of this one. Okay. So now the only reason why f is not a function is because b is not. But in this case, f is not a function because element a is mapped to two elements in the codomain. enough material to start the homework assignment for the for functions. So I'm going to postpone that one you know, for two days. Um, so hopefully on Thursday we'll be able to cover or finish all the topics for functions. Can you put it out there anyway? Sorry? Can you put it out there anyway? Sorry? Can you put it out there anyway? I think it is out already. If it is, I'm just going to have to go to the paper.